Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair here on Think Tech Hawaii. So happy to have you with us today. We've got a really great program. I'm here with Dennis Dunn from the Prosecutor's Office. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's really nice. I um, I know we tried one other time. Yeah, sorry and about so, that. <laughs> it was so great, though. He calls me up and he says, so I have to cancel. And he goes, and you're never going to get another excuse like this one. <laughs> Because Dennis has a service dog that he works with, and the dog went into heat, so we couldn't um, we couldn't very well have the dog come in, so so we had to cancel and reschedule for today. So I'm so happy that you're here because oh, I know we're really glad to be here, and it's a real pleasure. I know there's a lot to uh, to your job and what you do, and, and I really want to thank you for everything that you're out there doing. Um, you know, the title of our show is Finding Respect in the Chaos, and there's a lot of chaos out there, and this is a place where we can find some respect, and that's in the Victim Witness Program, Kokua Services. Victim Witness Kokua call. Services, Kokua correct. Kokua Services. And this just, I'm so amazed. You've been doing this for 40 years? Uh, it'll be 40 years on January 30. 30. Wow. January 3rd. January 3rd, which yeah. means you started when you were 10. Uh, well, something like that. Something <laughs> like that, right. That's a long time, and you've really seen some changes over the years uh, in the services and the programs and everything, A lot right? of things we do now are enhanced by electronic means, electronic notification to victims when, vict when the defendants are released. Right. Um, all of our records are electronic now, um, easy to email, not just information, but documents to victims. Wow. So if they need a court document, we just get it right off of our uh, case tracking system and email it directly to them. So. Or like, they, for example, if they need a copy of a no-contact order, uh, you get a call, someone's being released, and I call up the victim, and they say, I don't have a copy of my no-contact order. I just go ahead and take my email, send it out to them, and they've got it almost instantly. Oh, wow. And then can print it out for themselves. So they've got that backup in case they need uh, it. And then we never even dreamed. When I first started, we didn't even have cell phones or anything, you know. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were excited to have a Xerox machine and, <laughs> and, and no computers at all at that point in time. Right. What a difference that was. How would you even go about contacting people or working well, with people? Well, we had, you know, the old manual telephones. And, right. Um, it, it was oftentimes a challenge. But we were able to persevere. Um, right. You know, I think, especially when we first started, so many victims and witnesses had never had any help. But right. they were very grateful sure. to have anybody assist them because right. they, were, they were lost. I mean, I often compare our services to like a tour guide. <laughs> and a victim is essentially someone who's gone to a foreign country, right. doesn't know the language or the customs, and we're there to help provide that. Oh, that's a great analogy. You know, years ago in the early 80s, I went through some stuff with my father coming out, being abused as a kid and stuff. And so we were able to go through the victim witness program back then. And that was, you know, what, 30 40 years yes. ago, 30, yes. 30 some odd years yeah. ago. So it was back then when there weren't cell phones and all that stuff. And it was, you just got a message on your answering machine to come into the if, office. If you were lucky, you had an answering if machine. If you were lucky, well, right. So, um, you know, that's what we would just get a message and then go down to the office and pick up whatever I needed and, and stuff. So it was quite a bit different back then than it yeah. is now. It's, it's, it's an adjustment, um, especially those of us in the older generation aren't as a accustomed to um, assuming that electronic communications is the way to go. So a lot of people that we try to call don't want to call, they want us to text them. Oh my right? goodness. So texting right? people sometimes gets a response when calls don't. So <laughs> the other thing is email addresses tend to be more consistent over time. Okay. So that a lot of times we'll have their telephone number, but that changes um, for a variety of reasons or right. they don't take block calls or whatever. But if we have an email address, you can always all, almost always get to someone. So right. So what big, was big it advantage. that made you want to do this? Well, um, I actually started out as a volunteer for an organization called Women Against Rape. Right. Um, okay. Back in the late or mid to late 70s. Um, I had joined the organization after taking a class. Um, it was a class in sex roles um, taught by Dr. Libby Rue, who was one of the real pioneers in, right. locally in research on sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I don't know, I just kept asking her so many questions. She said, well, Dennis, we can't take up this whole class answering your questions. There is this organization, Women Against Rape. Um, if you're more interested, you could talk to them. They have lots of information. I ended up volunteering initially as a court monitor and then right. eventually as a victim advocate with them. And that's sort of what ended up getting me into the door at the prosecutor's office. So what's a court monitor? What is that? What, well, what does that do? In, the, do, in do? the old days, a number of programs, including Women Against Rape and then Mothers Against Drunk Driving subsequently, would have um, trained volunteers who would sit in the courtrooms, um, monitor cases. In our case, we would monitor sexual assault cases, right. um, in the, mostly in the circuit court. Um, and in the case of MAD, they would be monitoring the drunk driving cases. And so generally we would uh, evaluate the judges and the prosecutors and how the victims were treated. Um, right. And we made, actually I think, established a pretty good relationship uh, with some of the prosecutors, even the defense attorneys at times, and um, the judges, um, would be able to talk to them right. and give them feedback. Sure. Um, as well as ask some questions, you know, where there was a lot right. we needed to learn because the victims want to know a lot. So we need to be informed sure. and so they can be informed. Well, and they need to learn, too. So I would think that sort of happened in a different way, too, not just for you guys to learn and for the victims to learn, but for the prosecutors to learn a better way and, a, exactly. you know, and the judges. Because I can remember back in the day, there was, you know, unreliable witnesses. Oh. Everybody was called or it's too long of a time. And now we have all these new um, statutes from this latest bill that just passed where they have the extra two years. Right. So I had uh, Roy Chang and Victoria Chang on last right. time. Um, Roy Chang actually was with Women Against Rape at the time, the only man involved. Right? And when I joined and found out about him, I was so impressed. And so that's one <laughs> of the things that led me when I had an opportunity to intern at the prosecutor's office. I accepted oh, the, okay. the, uh, the opportunity because I'd been so impressed by him as a deputy prosecutor being involved with this organization. He is a remarkable guy. Yeah. I thought the same thing. He actually said to say hi to you because I told him oh, that you great, were coming great. on next, right? That you would be on my next show. I don't see him very so, often. Of course, Victoria worked in her office for a while, too. So right? To That's what they frequently. were telling me. And I had told her when I first met her, when she came into the office, that her dad was the reason why I started to work at the prosecutor's office back in uh, January 3rd of 1979. Wow. <laughs> Right, and I guess it was in the 80s that he moved out into Correct. private practice, Correct. right? It Correct, was He wasn't there that long while I was there. Right, um, okay. But certainly has maintained his longtime support and advocacy for victims, no question about that. Right, I know I was really proud that he came on. I had actually put, the, you know, put my feelers out and had talked to a number of different law offices and didn't hear back from anybody but them, oh, and boy, great. were they prepared. And I was so glad that they were the ones who <laughs> answered my call because they were the perfect people to come on, having had all the experience in the prosecutor's sure office. they had very accurate information, which is critical. I think a lot of times people think of different kinds of support that victims need. And of course, a lot of victims, of course, need counseling and therapy. Um, right. They need crime victim compensation to sure. help restore them financially. But a lot of what they need is information. Uh, Accurate information and consistent information right. can help reduce the trauma. Right. I mean, they've shown that. Studies have shown that. So when we can be there to provide them with the information on a timely basis, um, right. it can make the whole process easier. Because sure. I'm sure you've heard in the old days, people would always say, going through the criminal justice system was the second victimization for yes, victims. Yes, absolutely. And sometimes victims would even say it was worse than yeah. going you know, through the experience of the crime. Because at right. least when the crime takes place, it, Maybe for a relatively short period of time, but the criminal justice process seems to and often does take forever, especially right. more serious crimes often take a long time to go through the system. Right. And, you know, here in Hawaii, things are, are changing, and it's a good thing because they really need to change. Yeah. There's unfortunately too much of that good old boy thing going on and, and police being un, not fully trained on how to handle domestic violence situations and rape situations where they need to be trained further. And I know that Marcy Lopes um, it, from DVAC is starting to really work yes, with I the police. Yes, I just spoke to her this, this morning. But, oh, yeah, okay, and I <laughs> we know. I keep new, wanting to get her on my show, Talking about a new, pro a new project that we're trying to have a collaboration get together. Get going, to right? Get, get them in closer and earlier contact with victims. Right. I mean, we, right. we, you know, while we are part of the prosecutor's office, we obviously want to assist and improve the prosecution sure. of cases and make them successful. Right. Our, our primary responsibility is to the victims. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, in many of these cases, we know they may not have 
a positive outcome, or at least the outcome the victim might want. Right. But what we can do is help people get support services in the community that can help them become survivors, to go from victim to survivor. To survivor right. They need that kind of support, they regardless do. of how well the case comes out and Absolutely. even how happy the victim might be. The recovery process afterward is always difficult, right. and victims need all the help they can get. We have, fortunately, we have a lot of good programs in our community. We do. But they need to be linked up. They need to understand what right. they're all about. Sometimes it takes a more active, warm handoff to other agencies, so right. maybe even calling them up and say, I've got someone here, I'd like to have talk to you, right. or arrange for a meeting and bring someone, you know, an advocate from a, sure. a community agency in to meet with them with us. and. So just say here that here people can help you out. Um, also, quite frankly, uh, especially when, since you mentioned domestic violence cases, the victims aren't always ready to take advantage of the services. They're afraid. Um, right. They're financially dependent on the abuser. Sure. Um, and so sometimes it may take two or three times that we have a contact with them. And what we'd like to do is to partner with some other of our other community agencies, get them in contact with them, and just let them know that there's a whole network of support out there for them. And so there are, when they're ready to go, there's help there. The right, idea. and there's plenty. There's you know you got um, Catholic charities. You've got um, you've got your programs there. You've got DVAC. You've got SATC. Um, so DVAC is the Domestic Violence Action Center, and SATC is the Sex Abuse Treatment Center. And those are both local here. Right. Well, and parents and children together. Pat parents also and children. Has yeah, that's a big one. and they have a group. Support programs for victims. They have offender groups right. that they run to, and um, and actually, since I have to know about it, they're also merging with Children's Alliance, so they will be providing support service, special support services for sexually abused children too. Oh, how nice is that? Right. I'll tell you what a difference it makes when you have the kind of help that you need, right. and it can be so isolating. I think that's one of the biggest things. You feel like you're all alone, and even when you know in your head that you're not alone. In your heart, you feel like you're alone. Well, that's an extremely important point, Cynthia, because I think for a lot of victims, um, they don't feel that those who are around them support them, or they're maybe just reluctant to talk about their experience. Right. And so sometimes the only way that you can be able to get help and support is to talk to a trained counselor, a trained therapist, right. who can help you sort out and then I, I think really teach you how to engage your support network because sometimes right. that's hard to do. Like I said, right. sometimes just talking to people is a hard thing. You don't want to admit that this happened to you. Or domestic violence situations, we all know situations where the family has told them, hey, what are you doing with this guy? The guy's a real jerk and he's just going to you know, hurt you right. and you know, why are you staying with him? And then they're afraid afterwards when they're ready to leave, they don't want right. to everybody say, I told you so. And too much shame. Yeah. Shame helps people stay silent. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, this is all good <laughs> stuff. And we got more to talk about too, so I'm really hoping you'll stay with us, but we're gonna take a quick break, so don't go anywhere. Hey, aloha, my name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests, I'll bring you information, about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. え、各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは、ハワイ。各週の月曜日2時から、ぜひ
Um, what did you call it? Crime victim compensation. Crime victim compensation. So I got money. Yeah. I didn't get very much in it. And it was such a pain in the neck to try to do all the paperwork back and forth. I kind of just gave up and said, I, it's too much work. I don't care. Um, but so, Well, maybe we'll start first with a compensation program. Okay. Since you mentioned that. Right. Um, one of the things that I've, I'm sort of happy to be able to tell you is that we have a very close working relationship with them. So for uh, a lot of... Um, Far too many years, the process was far too difficult. Right. I mean, you had this program that could help people, but the process was, right. you know, very ground very slowly. Um, we had complaints even sometimes that when people went to appear before the commissioners, that the commissioners weren't very sympathetic and right. were victim blaming. And That's we agreed. We agreed with some of that. To be <laughs> honest with you, we even we went to the legislature and testified about that. But um, I think a lot of that's been changed. Also, under the current administrator, Pamela Ferguson Bray, she has implemented a whole administrative procedure that cuts out a lot of the, the wait time that victims used to have. Oh, wow. Um, that's so, the administrative great. processor can administratively review sure. cases and sign off them without every single case going to the commissioners. Now, only those cases that are appealed go to the commissioners. Oh, and okay. so that makes it a lot easier because that part is better. Right. Um, the other thing is, we work with them closely. Um, one of the requirements in our law is that the victim must have made a police report. And right. so the difficult thing about that is the commission then is responsible for reviewing the police report. And in the old days, we used to be able to just make a copy, our copy of the police report, make it right. available to them. The police sort of cracked down with some good reasons in terms of distributing out copies of oh, reports. Sure. Um, and so we had this kind of dilemma. The commission was forced to go down to the police station and... And uh, at a certain time, and oh they'd not gosh. pick them up, they'd have to sit there and read them and take notes. Oh my goodness. And so it, it was pretty ridiculous. So we developed a procedure where we just prepare a summary of the police report with all the important salient features of the particular case and put that information in this summary report and send it to the commission. And okay. we do that not only not only as our, our staff, our victim witness counselors involved in this process, we train our um, interns, our uh, MSW students and so on. Um, we train them to do this process so that we oh. Oh. tend to have a lot of people available to keep the process going so that nice. doesn't become an obstacle to someone getting their compensation. Oh, that's great. We also work extensively, and this is a service that we have across the board for all crime victims, is that we have interpretive services that we fund with some of our Victims of Crime Act funds, our VOCA funds. So that if there's any victim anywhere on Oahu who needs assistance for any type, of any type from a victim services agency, we will provide an interpreter for them. Wow. So, and this also includes a That's translating That's a big thing for people materials. to know here, especially here in Hawaii, yeah? Well, there's a lot. Of, it's amazing when you take, when you find out how many people for whom, you know, English is not their first language. And it's not sure. just people who don't speak English at all. It's people who don't understand yeah. to a great. And the criminal right. justice process and the victim compensation process are difficult to understand, sure even for those who, of us who speak English. Right. So we want to make sure that anyone who needs language assistance is going to get it. Right. And that's one of the things that we make sure and do. Like I said, we also translate materials or communications back and forth with the victim. We will translate those for any agency. So there's no cost to the agency, no cost to the victim. Wow. And you could go right into court with them even then. And, well, and the court, can you do the court, that? Well, the court is now obligated to provide interpreters, and they do a pretty good oh, job. Oh, so they have that. their own. But if we need interpreters prior to court or during interviews at our office sure. or when they do an intake with a domestic violence program or right. they're in a therapy program and need an interpreter, we will provide for the interpreters for any of those types of situations. Oh, that's So amazing. no crime victim on Oahu should be going without having a, a competent interpreter available for them. That is important. That's so, important for our, our viewers. And that's something to know. we did not have years ago. Yeah, you know, that's no. A, that's a big no. improvement. Um, in addition to that, I think one of the things that's really uh, critical is that we have been fortunate. Um, our legislature has provided a very, ex fairly extensive list of rights for victims. Now, a lot of people aren't aware of them, um, and that's one of the jobs we need to do. But there's a lot of things that can help the victim, first of all, get information so they know about their case. They understand the criminal justice process. Right. Next, they want to be able to know, okay, how can I participate in the process? Sure. So, for example, the victims have a right to be able to provide a statement. We call it a victim impact statement prior to someone being sentenced. Sure. So if someone's going to be sentenced in court, the victim has an opportunity to submit as part of the pre-sentence investigation 
So that judge, when they're looking at, okay, what kind of sentence would this person okay. get? Gets they're looking at, okay, the victim's exactly. Statement. How did That's this crime huge. affect the victim? Not just was this guy a Boy Scout or go to church every Sunday. Right. We want to know what was the this effect. Girl or exactly. This guy, right. Exactly. Oh, um, the other thing is, victims difference. have a right at the time of sentencing to appear and make a statement in court. Right. And so we need to let them know that they can do that. Um, the exciting thing is that we're able to be there with them, as well as our courthouse dog, Clover, can be there with them at the Like sentencing. you guys saw in the picture, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's made a big the, difference, too. A lot Clover's of a great and dog. And there you go. Full of love and full of all kinds of comfort. It's uh, so great that you have her. And she's such a good dog. Yeah, she is. She's, well, she's trained by Assistance Dogs of Hawaii. She's the same training as any regular assistance dog that helps a disabled person. She's in a subcategory that they call facility dogs, and she's a courthouse dog, facility dog. Um, okay. Every county now has a courthouse dog uh, with their prosecutor's office. So oh, that's proud awesome. To say we're the first, first state in the country where every single jurisdiction has a dog. You know, there, we, here in Hawaii, we've got a lot of the first state in the country stuff, or the only state in the country that does it, and things like that. But I think it's just really amazing. It makes me very proud yeah, to live here. It does. It does. Yeah. And uh, the other uh, exciting thing is that um, some other programs are getting dogs, too. So Clover's sister, Cassie, works in as an assistance dog with Child Welfare Services on Maui. Oh, my goodness. So not only is she involved the in the courts, but she also assists, you know, when Child Welfare Services is investigating a case. Oh, and so, for kids, that's, like, huge to have yeah. a dog to pet and You'd be surprised how many doors it opens. Yeah, I'll bet. And with people, grown-ups, too, right? Absolutely. I've had cases where we, uh, initially the prosecutor asked for the dog to be available for the child. But then I find this parent spends more time with Clover than the, <laughs> than the, <laughs> than the child. child. <laughs> the parent is more interested. I mean, I can even remember an instance where a uh, parent went in and had a, a terrible time being cross-examined by a defense attorney for, oh, for a half hour or more, Aww. 45 minutes. And she came out of the courtroom and she just laid down. This was our previous courthouse dog, Pono. But just laid down on the floor with Pono for about 10 minutes. Didn't say anything, Aww. just laid there. And then when she got up, she said, thank you, Pono, I needed that. Oh, so, that's so precious. We've also had kids who wouldn't, oh, who wouldn't talk until they had a dog in wow. the interview with them. So, and there's some that, you know, who wants to bring their child to the prosecutor's office? Nobody, um, It's yeah. not something that uh, I, as a parent, would like to do. But if I know there's a dog there... And they like dogs. It's like, hey, this is a great thing. So right. it encourages people to want to come back. Maybe they don't want to like to come back for the interviews, but they could like to come back and see Clover. And come back for the so, dog. Exactly. And they get to play after their interview. They get to play with the dog in the conference room. They throw the ball around or oh, do anything cool. that they like, and they just have fun with the dog. And just have fun. It's yeah, not exactly. like she's working anymore. Exactly. She has to take off her little... It's exactly. So, so is she, dog. like, always on... The job when she's got her leash on is that the thing? Well, like, the idea I know is when she has her vest, when she has her vest on, it's when, when she has working. her vest. She so has. She knows she's, she's working. working. All right. That's amazing. I know I want to get a dog for me, um, <laughs> but I just want a small dog, not a big dog <laughs> like Clover. <laughs> I need something I can carry around. But so this is so amazing. I love that they're bringing dogs into right. the program and stuff too. So what other, now wait, one thing we need to, I think, point out here, like when we were, when I was talking to Roy Chang and Victoria Chang, um, they were talking about civil cases. Right. So, and that's different. You are dealing with criminal cases, well, right? Well, it's not completely different. And one of oh, the okay. things that's kind of important to change in the law is that if there is a restitution order made in a case, and they now make freestanding restitution orders in the criminal cases. Oh. Um, that order can be enforced as a civil judgment. So if you oh. had uh, the, the court ordered, um, you know, $10,000 in restitution, you can register that order, you file it with the court, and then you can go try to enforce that order in the same way that you might do a regular civil judgment. So not, not everybody would have the necessarily the desire or the means to get involved in a protracted civil proceeding, but if they want right. to be able to enforce their restitution and it hasn't already been paid, then they can enforce sure. it that way, which is great. Now, the other side of that, which is good, is that we now have um, an extensive program within the Department of Public Safety in cooperation with the Crime Victim Compensation uh, Commission, where they actually collect all the restitution from the inmates oh. and from the parolees. Oh. And it is a very um, well well-run process in the sense that the inmates are required to 
um, pay 25% of their accounts each month to pay the restitution until it's satisfied. And so the interesting thing is many of the individuals who go to prison who are on parole are more likely to have their restitution fully paid off than the individuals who are on probation right. because they have this whole system they of enforcement yeah. that it's a mandatory thing and it's required the victim make sure that they get their money. The other thing is for the offender is that it can demonstrate to the paroling authority when they come up for parole that they've taken responsibility for their oh, crime yeah. by making sure the restitution was paid and that will make them look at better in Which the eyes better of the paroling for them. Yeah, so sure. as a positive aspect on them. And the Crime Victim Compensation Commission, they collect, you know, the parolees come in and actually pay at the commission office. And they tell us that a lot of the offenders say, you know, I really feel good about myself now because I feel like I've, I've taken responsibility yeah. in a tangible way. In other words, the, the monetary uh, assessment they've had for restitution to restore the victim makes them feel like right. they've done something concrete. Right. And so that's an important thing, not just for, for the, their own the victim, self. but also yeah, for, the for their own so. self esteem. Oh my gosh, there's so much more to talk about. I know we've only got a couple minutes left. Do you have one last thing that you'd like to sort of, what's the very most important thing that you guys well, do the there? The most important thing is that we're there to listen to people. And right. a lot of times victims, the hard, hardest thing is they feel like nobody's listening. And the first thing that we do is put our, a lot of effort in there trying to listen to what the victim has to say. What are, they, what are their needs? What are their fears? Right. What are their concerns? Um, and then try to do what we can to address those. But listening to people is the most important. Now, we only have worked with victims for a short time period, right. so the really important thing is that if your family member or friend or your friend at church or whatever, your classmate at school, if they've been a victim, you have to support them because we depend on them getting that support right. on a daily basis because that's what's going to help, again, the victim to go from victim to survivor is if they have support from family and friends in the community. Absolutely. Which is really more than what we can do. Boy, that is the wisest thing, too, because that's exactly what everybody out there needs to do. If it's your friend, your neighbor, someone in your family, like he said, that you have to be the daily support for that person. They may have big support systems through the government or through victim witness, but, but they still need you every single day. Yeah, victims need to be believed and supported. They need Absolutely. To know that it's not their fault and that they're going to be um, getting their their support system surrounding and protecting them. Right. Not questioning them or blaming. Right, and you're not alone. Everyone just needs exactly. to remember they're not alone. Dennis, thank you so oh, much real for coming. Pleasure. This is I really appreciate having you here today. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for Finding Respect in the Chaos today. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair on Think Tech Hawaii, and I hope you will join me for my next show. Take care.